Now I'd like to introduce um, Maryland State Highway Administration's Deputy Administrator for Planning, Engineering, Real Estate, and Environmental Initiatives, Greg Slater. Greg is a 1967, or 1997, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> Sorry, Greg. <laughs> the lighting in here. <laughs> 1997 graduate of Towson University, a 2007 graduate of the University of Maryland National Leadership Institute, a 2009 graduate of the Maryland DOT Advanced Leadership Program, a member of the Leadership Maryland Class of 2015. Greg has 19 years of experience with the last 17 years at MDOT after two years in the private sector. That tenure includes 10 years on the engineering design side of MDOT and a focus on technology, seven years as the Highway Planning Director in the last nine months as the Deputy Director overseeing planning, engineering, real estate, and environmental initiatives. Under Greg's leadership, Maryland has focused on innovative, data-driven performance and establishing relationships to develop sustainable solutions for Maryland. Through this approach, Maryland's efforts center on data-driven performance-based planning solutions for congestion and safety, sustainability of investments, linking of planning and safety, GIS-based asset data warehousing for a comprehensive asset management approach, innovative innovations in traveling demand modeling and multimodal planning solutions that focus on community and industry input. On top of the being the Deputy Highway Administrator, Administrator, Administrator for Maryland, Greg also serves as the ASHTO SCOP, COP leadership team, chair of the, S, the SCOP data subcommittee, TRB Asset Management Committee, and the CTPP Oversight Board, a member of the TRB Data Section, and has really recently been nominated to the board for the Bureau of Transportation Statistics. <coughs> if we can have a round of applause for Greg Slater. Thank you, Rod, and thank you for having me here today. As you can tell, uh, Throughout my career, I'm a bit of a data junkie, so this is a friendly crowd for me. I know all of you appreciate the value of that. I'm going to talk a little bit today about Maryland, teach you a little bit about where you are today, uh, some of the challenges, some of the dynamics that we have that, that give us a bit of a unique system. I'm going to talk about our bridge program. I'm going to brag about our bridge program a little bit. And then I'm going to talk about some of the innovations that we're really jumping into in, across the state. So Maryland. As you can see, uh, we have a lot of traffic. You probably saw that coming in, and I'm going to talk a little bit through that. If you look at Maryland across the board, we have the Lower Eastern Shore, uh, really low-lying areas, uh, coastal, bay, and uh, ocean coast. You go across the state to really the probably our most heavily populated section right there in the middle between the Baltimore-Washington corridor and then uh, Western Maryland, which is really a, a completely different climate in itself. So if you look at that state, we have a lot of unique challenges in terms of what we're trying to address in our transportation system on top of 3,100 miles of coastline. So we have uh, a, a lot to deal with and a lot of dynamics. The Baltimore-Washington region, uh, where you are today, is one of the most well-connected transportation systems in the world, but it's also one of the most congested in the country. Every once in a while, every couple of years, we have to thank the Los Angeles market for being the top market for congestion, but every once in a while, we flip-flop back and forth. We're number one, they're number one, depending on what the dynamics go and the economy goes. 56.4 billion VMT in 2014, we're now up above 57 billion. 72% of that is on the roadway system that we oversee. Estimated cost of congestion, $1.7 billion. That's up around two now. When we calculate cost of congestion, that's people that are stuck in traffic every day. Your time, uh, the gas you're burning, what you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis in this Baltimore, Washington region. And it really comes down to population and economy. 19th in population, fifth in population density, all in an interstate system between the two uh, Baltimore, Washington, and Carter. 1.1 million more people by 2040. So it's growing, the job market's growing, the economy's improving. That all comes with different demands for us. This next slide really talks about what we're going to be dealing with in our future and talk a little bit about how important that is to our bridge program today. If you look at the growth that we're seeing across our state as the economy is improving, 12% increase in 
automobile traffic, okay, you know, we can manage that. 61% increase in truck traffic on our system over the next 20 to 30 years. That's because of the expansion of our port, our proximity some of, to some of the other distribution centers across the country and how they come in and go across our interstate system. That can really tax a system. And when you're talking about that amount of truck traffic, as you're looking at the growth and you add that mix of growth in our congestion system today, it's really a challenging. So we're looking at largely because of that truck traffic growth, 64% increase in our congestion. So we're trying to deal with some pretty significant things uh, as well as keep an economy moving at the same time. The interesting thing is if you look at that uh, graph in the lower right hand corner there, you see a lot of that growth is in our rural region. And as that's growing, we have different things. Uh, Rod and I were just talking before, uh, I went out to Western Maryland and uh, there's a lot of large moves going out there with these really, really large wind turbine blades. And they're a tremendous resource out in our rural areas because the wind energy uh, industry is really uh, expanding in Western Maryland in the mountains and then on the lower shore. But uh, really trying to get some of, facilitate some of those heavy moves is really a challenge for us. So changes in Maryland. Coastline brings other things. We've had temperature increases, 2.4 degrees Fahrenheit since 1900, which may not sound like a lot, but what it happens is, is these high pressure, low pressure systems, these weather systems, we get these extreme events a lot more. Over the last 100 years, sea level rise in the Chesapeake Bay region has, has risen about one foot. Now our bridge team likes to remind us that the bridges are fine, it's the approaches that we have to worry about. So uh, we work on that and try and connect that. But 13 islands. We have islands throughout the Chesapeake Bay area that have houses on them, infrastructure, but they're all abandoned. Uh, they just had that sea level rise and it's really changed some things and some of the dynamics. We had a, a local bridge that was replaced over on the eastern shore and uh, I had to laugh at the quote from one of the locals that said it was a monument to man's stupidity. It was a million dollars to replace a bridge to an island that we could have bought for half a million dollars. So how do you kind of manage some of these dynamics and really these land use changes? As this, as this problem starts to grow for us or this challenge starts to grow for us, 2.4 feet by 2100. At lower eastern shore area on the far right hand corner of that slide, that's a huge elevation change there. You know that most of that is uh, at sea level rise today, at sea level today. On our system, 2,565 state highway bridges other 357 other state bridges that are owned by the Transportation Authority, which are their toll facilities. Maryland Aviation, which uh, handles the uh, roadways around our airport facilities, and MTA, our, our Maryland Transit Administration. 2,300 local bridges, significant part of the system today. A lot of these local bridges are the ones that are going to be impacted by that coastal change that we're starting to see. 19 movable bridges, 166. We have a lot of history here in Maryland. 166 historical eligible bridges. And then we have their signature bridges like Woodrow Wilson and Chesapeake Bay Bridge. Woodrow Wilson is the one in the far right hand corner of the bridge. Uh, uh, the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, uh, both spans uh, are on the upper right hand corner. That second span was built uh, in the late 60s. So those are just starting to, to get to the point now. I, I had a statistic the other day where we, it costs us more to paint the Bay Bridge today than it did to originally build it. So we're constantly circling back and forth uh, on these bridges and we just started a new study to try and understand what the future of that is, how we're gonna pay for the next one, those types of things. So some unique challenges. Our bridge condition today, I'm gonna start bragging a little bit about our program. This is the program that helps me sleep at night. I sleep well because we have a great bridge team. 69 structure deficient bridges, less than 3% of our system. We can look at a spreadsheet today and really identify the funding for a lot of those bridges where we are, we've prioritized them. 21 are weight posted, 99% of them carry all legal loads. The big tidal wave is that 353 bridges that's kind of hanging at that number five uh, rated on a major element. How do we keep those? And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in our approach. But a lot of them are potentially becoming structure deficient. So how do we prevent that and deal with the ones that are already there? Because we know that takes money. We have a two pronged approach. I believe that we've had success in our bridge program uh, really because we've been able to bring 
remedial and capital together under one roof with one funding source with complete flexibility in that funding. We can look at our program and say, let's do this over here and let's do this over here and let's work together and figure out how it all works, disperse it out and get the thing, uh, get what we want accomplished. Painting program, it's been a big program for us last couple of years. Uh, we've worked through some unique ones uh, <laughs> over the last several months, but uh, we got them through and uh, we've had some real challenges, but they're really, uh, it pays off when you can get out there and paint a bridge and add some life to it. Deck overlay program, our invert paving, our concrete repairs. Try and get out there before a bridge becomes structurally deficient. So when you manage to that structure deficient number, how do we do some of that remedial work to keep it from becoming structurally deficient? Extend the life, or how do you address that element that's already there? Major rehab, replacement, slab replacement, small structure replacement. Uh, that team that works together, eliminate the element, major, minor rehab, and really your total replacement. We get to that point. The other thing that we really talk about routinely is looking at the redundancy in our system. Anytime we can remove a bridge from our system, that's a great opportunity for us. You know, we've had a number out in uh, the western part of the state where we had one come up that was structurally deficient. If we took it out, it would make people travel an extra quarter of a mile. Take it out. Let's figure out how to reduce that overall number. It works well, work with the community, try and figure that out. It's less maintenance in, it, in the end. Keep the element from becoming structurally efficient. That's that uh, remedial program that really works well for us. This is really how we got there. Investment in bridges. You can see our dollars went up and our number went down. We kept the number there. Uh, we had a sustained, we continue to have a sustained investment in our bridge program. We were very forward uh, in pushing that all the way up to our governor who is now talking a lot about structure deficient bridges. Uh, we actually, uh, we had a governor the other uh, few months back that climbed under one. He wouldn't know what a structure deficient bridge looked like. So we met him out there, he climbed underneath of it and he was like, wow, this is bad. <laughs> so, you know, you kind of work with him and uh, he's interested in helping us to keep that investment going. So it's really great to have that and reduce that number. This is the, really the telling program. That, that top number is the size of our total financial program. And you can see that those, that number has gone down continuously over the last several years. But that orange on the bar graph is the size of the investment that we've made in bridges. As our revenue has declined, we have remained steady in investing in bridges and kept it in the front of our program. The reason we did that is we felt like it was taking care of our existing system was where we needed to prioritize our investments and keeping that going uh, was a huge part of our success in this program. Uh, that number on the top that it's gonna continue to grow ground, go down. One of the challenges we're dealing with right now is, and we were able to keep our bridge program sustained at the same level, gas prices are up and down. The way our gas revenues our trust fund revenues are based on gas tax and sales tax that go up and down with construction costs, oil costs and asphalt costs. It's, a, it's an indexed number. Last year's program was built on $3.50 a gallon gas. So guess what happens when you try and rerun that number again this year? You got a big hole to fill. So we had to fill that hole, six, seven hundred million dollar hole in our program. We did it without touching the bridge program. How do we keep the bridge program steady? And it's really about uh, continuing to reinforce that message if we want to make those numbers down. And then taking those big ones. Every structure efficient bridge is not created equal. Some are a million dollars and some are 500. How do you keep those out early, knowing that you need to address those separately? Investing in bridges with our employees. I, uh, when I came in as the highway planning director seven, eight years ago, uh, one of the things I noticed over in Bridge was nobody ever left. So I went down and I talked to Mr. Friedman, who was a bridge director. I said, how do you get everybody to stay? Uh, and he told me it was very simple. He said, you let them work on the good projects. And one of the things that, uh, that they do in the bridge office is allow their teams to select, you know, so what it ends up being is you get to work on the really cool bridges and your consultants, you give them kind of the boring stuff. I'm sure I offended all the consultants in the room. But you give them the culverts, 
those types of things. But it's really about keeping the, uh, the really good challenging work for us. And you develop your employees, you keep them happy, you keep them really engaged in these processes and allow them part of that process to pick. Use innovation and proven techniques. Over the years, we try things. We feel like we know what works and what doesn't. What's good for a sustained investment? What can we try here that may be great, but we know we're gonna have to deal with it later on down the road? And trying to understand and learn those lessons and weave them very slowly into our processes. And all are under one roof. Really that remedial and capital under one roof, one budget, one delivery, one group of folks that come together and make those choices. I'll take these, you take these, and we'll manage that number and keep it down. Uh, just in 2015, 216 minor rehab bridge projects completed, 37 small structure rehabs, 39 bridge paint, painted, three small structures replaced, 16 emergency responses. A lot of those were weather related, but you know you deal with some real challenges on the emergency responses. Uses of innovation. This is a, a use of an acoustic technique, uh, acoustic technology that we're using on the Woodrow Wilson Bridge. We had a challenge that we thought we uh, was associated with some, uh, with some other bridges where we use similar techniques. So we worked out and, and brought in this acoustic emission system to understand so we can hear it. And you, it, so you can really detect when those strands break and we know what would happen. Now everything's been great so far, which is a real challenge at Woodrow Wilson. If you've ever been across there, it's pretty uh, dynamic bridge structure and a movable one. And we're gonna monitor it for 10 years to see how it works. It's really about using these innovations. This one is about tilt gauges. I talked about some of these heavy moves and understanding uh, what's happening on our bridges. This program was really started uh, looking at, trying to look at some of these uh, fracture critical bridges so that we can understand really what's happening with them on a day-to-day -day basis, but really trying to tackle those. These are great technologies for us to have for a data junkie like me, knowing what's coming in and being able to look at that system. High definition video and infrared imaging. This is a technology that has really advanced probably tenfold over the last decade. I know I was telling Rod that I worked with a little bit of this technology early in my career where they're looking at really high resolution scanners. And one of the big challenges we had then was the file sizes were so huge that you couldn't process it, couldn't understand it. But when you're looking at a bridge like this, you can go out and look at it every week. You're still not gonna be able to tell if that cracks a little bigger unless you really get some real good technology. But getting into this high definition video and infrared imaging, we can start to see the progression and deterioration and the regression of some of these bridges so that we know when we need to act and when we don't need to act and really an accurate reflection of the changing condition. That way we can start to predict and project. Innovative technology. Performance of bridges under loads, normal conditions and under loading. A resource that provides accurate information on the condition of a bridge. We can do it with no disruption of traffic. Get out there and it's huge. Maintenance of traffic on our system. We have, uh, you know, the, the heaviest, the hev most heavily traveled part of our system is Capitol Beltway American Legion Bridge coming from Virginia into Maryland, 250 to 275,000 cars a day with a 65% directional spl split on the commute. Huge. Direct, may, any kind of disruption in traffic is catastrophic for that area. It's an area that sees probably six to seven mile backups for an hour and a half every single day. So how do you just, any hiccup can really challenge that. Relatively inexpensive, non-destructive. We can get out there monitor things that, on a daily basis. To really summarize uh, what I wanted to talk about today is we've had a lot of successes in our bridge program, mainly because first and foremost, the team I had that as the fourth bullet, but I'll talk about that uh, first. We have a really strong team. We recruit, we retain, we keep it all under one roof so that we can make good decisions and not get limited by the flexibility that we put on ourselves and our funding, whether it's maintenance or capital. Steadily, continually prioritize bridges. Maintain your investment in bridges. That's our message. It costs money. We have to maintain that investment. And use these innovative practices. 
accelerated bridge technology, the use of data and technology to really get out there and, and try and understand what's happening on these bridges and then working together and trying to understand. I talked a little bit about it on the first slide, but our employees' perspective, what they're bringing to the table, our customers' perspective. Now, I talk about our customers' perspective uh, to summarize, but the first thing you need to realize is our customers are not realistic. They want free-flowing traffic, no potholes, they want everything to be great. So we have to manage to that expectation. And when we do that, and we can really deliver, then we have a successful program. So welcome to Maryland. I hope you enjoy it. If you go to the game tomorrow, you have to root for the Orioles. We're three games back in a four-game series against the Red Sox, so it's a critical one. Thank you for having me.